OK, so that's the recording and the transcription started. So we have been talking for a while about the process of interacting with a business. Figuring out who's involved, either internally or externally, trying to figure out how much they're involved, trying to figure out different ways of talking to them and recording that information. And that's kind of been the business side of what we've been doing. But of course, this is business systems analysis. So what we're doing today is moving more towards the systems analysis side. But this is the kind of transition. So we'll be moving on in later weeks to do more formal diagramming. And remember, that's coming up and it's a huge part of your assessment. What we're doing today is something called business activity modelling. And um, it's, it's incredibly high level stuff. And the idea is that it's accessible to both sides. So as we get into more of the technical stuff, you wouldn't expect uh, a, a typical business person to interact well with a, a, a data dictionary, for example. They might do, but you, you can't expect them to. But the sort of things that we're looking at today are on that cusp of, yeah, business can understand them. Systems analysis people can understand them. So we're getting to something where everybody can sit around the table and, and talk about it. So they are very, very high level. Oh, for goodness sake, it doesn't work and then it. They are high level. So you remember we did a cap one analysis uh, quite a few weeks ago now. The idea is we're trying to figure out what the organisation does. Now, it's not how they do it, so it's not they use a wireless card reader to take a credit card payment. It's they take payments. It may also be they take credit card payments, and that might be different to taking cash payments. But it's what they do, not necessarily how it's done. Because, of course, that's going to be part of your analysis and maybe part of the change process that you're hoping to introduce into the business. So we are creating these things because this is us going back to the business and saying, we have spent this time, we've investigated your business, we've spoken to people. These are all the things we think you do. Am I right? <sighs> no, I didn't touch that. I really didn't touch it. So there are ways of sitting down with people in the business and saying, this is what we've found out. This is our understanding. Can you just confirm this for me? So everybody can get together, look at these. Oh, for our goodness sake. Everybody can get together, look at these and come to an agreement that this is what they they wanted to happen. This is the business. And if there's anything missing, the business people can go, oh no, you've forgotten about. So as I say, it's what the organisation does, not necessarily how they do it, because that is part of another analysis that we'll be doing, something called a gap analysis. And that's the difference between what the business is doing now and what it would like to be doing. Now, that could be in terms of the kind of business it's in, or it could be in terms of how it manages the business it's doing. So it could be saying, um, we are going to build a holiday lodge in the grounds of the hotel and start hiring out self-catered lodges to people. So that's a new business stream. And the gap is between what they're currently doing, hotel rooms, and what they'd like to do, hotel rooms and lodging. Or it could be a gap in, in, a, in a business process. So they currently take uh, 
the bookings and put them into a diary by hand, and that's that's the source of truth for what's coming up. But of course, that diary is in one place in the hotel, and it can only be done if somebody's actually physically at the front desk. So you might say that you might want to move towards an electronic version. So the gap there is between how they currently do it and how they would like to perform the process. The process itself, taking a reservation, stays the same. So this kind of diagram will stay the same. So it gives you the chance of laying out in black and white where you think the business is just now. It gives the stakeholder the opportunity to look at that and agree or disagree. And don't forget, that's quite a big thing for what we do here. At some point, you have to say, sign this off and agree with what we're doing. There's no point in you doing all this, deciding what the issues are, creating a new system, installing it, and then the business going, oh yeah, but see way back then, that wasn't right. One of the things you're doing with this is to get it signed off and to get the agreement of the uh, business at every step. And this is one of those steps. Here's what we think the business does. Are you OK with that? It also gives us an opportunity to look at business processes from different points of view, and that can be helpful both for us and for the business to understand why you might want to make changes. Is the um, is the experience of booking a room. So for the person who's doing it in the hotel, it's quite simple. Somebody phones them up, they write down name and address, put them in when they're coming, maybe take some credit card details as a deposit, and away you go. Maybe the customer doesn't like that. From the point of view of the customer, it's a bit of a faff. Well, they've already discovered they're not online. How do they find their phone number to begin with? It's not like we get yellow pages anymore. How do we even know they exist to look up the number? And then once we've got the number, we have to phone them up. So we have to find a time that we can phone them up and be on the phone. And I don't know how many times I've had to spell my second name and they still get it wrong. It's a bit of a mess. So maybe from the customer's point of view, they would prefer a simple online form. So we can look at these processes, not just as a process, but also from different points of view. And again, that can give us insight into possibly the best way forward for the changes that we're making. It can give us a way of explaining to the business why those are changes that will be helpful for the business because they're helpful for the customer. So we can show what you're doing now and the gap to what our uh,
<laughs> Sean, that, that, no. Uh, it was funny. I was fiddling with my camera, and then all of a sudden the audio cut out. Then I was like, did I do that? <laughs> Someone can start the presentation now and just get out of the way. <laughs> uh, Sean, are you in the same group as Logan? I have no idea why I'm typing. Yeah, I, do. I am. I may have already seen yours. I oh. was like, yeah, I was I was hunting for um for uh for the what's it called uh the the YouTube channel that Tony posts Tony. into. Uh, and I I saw I think I saw a video. I skimmed it and I immediately stopped. I'm like, no, I shouldn't. I should wait Could like be. everyone else. It's very badly edited. <laughs> Did I hear my name getting taken in vain there? No, no. It was just my own ineptitude. I was trying to find the YouTube channel you post for videos to, and I was looking in YouTube rather than looking in Teams. <laughs> yeah, there's a link in Teams. It's one of the tabs up top. All right, apologies for that. Um, and on the basis that this is being recorded and I will be uploading it to YouTube, can I just point out that I am on Sky Broadband and it has been awful for the past fortnight. Um, now, I don't know where I froze. So, I think I'd finished this slide. Unless anyone tells me any different, I will move on from this and move to the next slide. OK, I'm not seeing anybody complaining. So we will do that. I will move on to The next slide. OK, so. We are trying to create some business processes and. To do that, we need to have figured out what those business processes are. Now, I know that you've been thinking a lot about. Um, all the stuff that happens. So. While we're going through this. What I want you to do is tell me about all those things. So this is just a text thing and think about business processes like booking a room. Stick those in. This is the sort of thing where we're, if we're in a, a real class, I would be sort of going around the room saying, you name one, you name one. But as I can't do it, this is the best I can do. So start sticking things in. Hopefully, once we've done that, um, we will be able to see. Uh, there we go. So you can start seeing a, a wordle on there. If you look at more. So the, the polls in the chat, if you look at more, you can start to see a word of what people are entering and that might trigger you. To have some other ideas. OK, so. We are thinking of all these business processes. And the diagrams themselves. Uh, comprise five specific parts do enable plan monitor control now under doing i've said 
what the business does. Now, that's not the business as a whole. This is a particular business process that you're thinking about. So it's not we run a hotel. It's we take bookings. We have to clean rooms. We have to serve them breakfast. We have to whatever. Then you think about what you need for that to happen. And that's everything that you need. It could be staff. It could be raw materials. It could be time. It could be anything at all. And you then figure out whether you have them or not. And we had some questions before in terms of the number of staff. And one of the answers I gave was, oh, yes, we do have staff that they are full time, but we also have part time people that we can call on. And that's part of this exercise. We need to plan what resources we need. So at um, two o'clock on a wet Wednesday afternoon, we don't need the same resources that we would need if we were hosting a wedding on a Saturday night. So we need to plan the resources. We then monitor that that's working. Did we get it right? Were there enough people to take out the food to the wedding guest? Were there enough people to bring the plates back? Were people waiting at the bar to be served? And then we can um, control those things in order to improve how well the business works. OK, so we can start by thinking about what we're doing and you're already doing that in terms of the responses to that poll. So please keep going. It's really helpful. And if you um, haven't thought of any of these things, then they should probably you should probably be thinking of them now. There's been 37 responses, so you should probably think, oh, so there's at least 37 processes that are going on here. Maybe they're going to need to find my way, their way into my report. So the doing part is the heart of it. This is what we're doing. And again, uh, it comes from our cat wall thing that we did a few weeks ago. So it's all the business activities. And one of the ways that we present this and one of the ways we make it uh, accessible and understandable is to do only one doing thing per diagram. So split them out. If there's more than one, make more than one diagram. Then you figure out what resources that you need for that. What do you need to enable? And as I say, there could be lots of those things. There's some examples on the screen there of what you might want. But depending on the doing object, there might be other ones as well. It really does just depend. And once you've figured out what it is you want to do and what you need to make that happen, you need to plan it. Of course you need to plan it. Why would you be doing anything if you don't plan them? If you are intending to do a specific activity and you don't have the staff, then you need to recruit staff. But of course, that brings up its own questions. What kind of staff? How many? Do they need, can you just bring them in or do they need specific training? All of these things need to be thought about in terms both of what you're doing and what you might want to do. I need a cook. Fantastic. Is it just one? Well, we'll actually know because we've got 100 people coming. Probably need more than one person. What do you think? Five? I don't know. Five? Yes. Five seems about right. OK, so we can just get anybody. Well, no, they need to have experience in catering for lots of people and they need to have somebody that knows how to do desserts and somebody that knows. Well, you can think it through yourself. Go watch some episodes of MasterChef to get an idea. So you need to plan. And then once you've done that, you need to monitor. It. Now, you can't monitor unless you know what it is you're expecting. Some people make the mistake of monitoring and going, oh, yeah, well, that's what I was wanting. No, decide what you want. If you're running a call centre, you might say the target is all calls answered within 10 seconds. I've no idea if that's a reasonable target or not. I don't run a call centre. 
but at least then I have a target and I can say whether or not I am reaching it. Now, it might be that's uh, too loose a target and you might want people to answer within the ring, so you might want to change the target to five seconds. Or it might be that that's impossible and you might want to change the target to 20. Either way, it still gives you something to measure against. So you need to figure out what you're monitoring before you decide um, to monitor. It's cheating otherwise. So those are some of the things that you might want to monitor. What's the percentage of rooms that are occupied? We don't, uh, we might not get the rack rate for the room, so what are we getting on average when a customer books a room? Are we getting good feedback? Entirely up to you what these things are that you monitor, but they should of course be related to the business and to the business of making the business better because you want continual improvement in your organisation. And then we get to control, so that's that's fixing it. So you've decided what you want to, oops, to monitor. You then have those results. And those results might be good. We want to have 80% uh, of our available seats in the restaurant taken all the time. Oh, we actually got 90%, isn't that good? It is good, but does that mean that your initial planning was incorrect? Did you only get enough staff to cover four fifths instead of nine tenths of the restaurant? Did you only buy enough supplies to make uh, 50 meals instead of 60? Or the outcomes might be negative. I came to the restaurant and nobody came to take my order for half an hour. And then when they took my order, it took 45 minutes to get there. Everybody's complaining about the fish and chips being soggy. I had a waiter who kept dropping things on me. So there could be positive, there could be negative outcomes and you will have to um, decide what you do about them. And again, that's partly business and partly analysis. Anybody get any questions about that before we move on? Getting more responses in the poll, which is good. And again, um, you should be having a look at the the responses and feel free to add in more things because I think the responses might um, jog your thoughts and think of some other processes that you might want to do. OK, so let me give you an example of how these diagrams look. Here is a business activity model for a waste service. So this is from an organisation called the Improvement Service who serve Scotland's councils. And I've chosen this one because, um, well, hopefully you all know what a waste, a waste service looks like. You put things in the bin, you take your bin out to the outside bin, that outside bin gets collected, no more rubbish. So how does that happen? Well, the first thing you might want to do is decide, OK, I am doing, I am providing a first class waste service. That might be you're doing, because you already provide a waste service. But what you're saying is, what we want to do is make it better. What do you need to do that? You need to decide on your waste strategy. 
you need to decide on the equipment. You need like thin lorries and refuse compactors. You need to figure out what staff you'll need. You need to figure out what your customers are going to look like. Even for a waste service, are you getting mostly recyclable paper? Are you getting mostly tin? Are you getting mostly rubbish that has to be chucked in landfill? So taking each of those in turn with the customers, you need to say, OK, we are going to provide a better waste service. And part of the way we're going to do that is to give you extra bins so that you can split up your rubbish so that we're not throwing everything in a landfill. So you're going to get, in addition to your normal bin, you're going to get one bin for glass and one bin for paper. Please put them, please put those items in those different bins for me. So you need a customer awareness campaign. And you need to tell people about that. The staff that you need for that are going to be varied. Of course, you need people to wander about in a truck and grab some uh, bins. But you're going to need other things. You're going to need people to plan the route and decide which one is the most uh, efficient. You're going to need people to write that advertising copy. You're going to need people to knock on the doors if people persistently put a black bin rubbish into the recyclables. So you're going to need those staff and you're going to have to train them in what they're doing. You're going to need equipment and storage because when you pick up all your recycled paper, you probably have an intermediate storage place before it's all sent away to be recycled. And of course, you're going to need to get an agreement with that co other company as to how that's going to work and when it's going to work and what they'll accept. So you're going to need a place where the bin lorries come and dump the paper, and then you're going to need a big shed where you have a bulldozer put into a big pile. And maybe you're going to need to have it all compressed into blocks that can be loaded in the back of lorries to be taken to the recycling center. I don't know. But you'll need that kind of enabling stuff to provide your first class waste service. And then you're going to have to monitor. You want to monitor things like the, how well the equipment done, how well the staff have done, whether the, your customers are happy with it. And I've been watching the comments and there's certainly some people who are unhappy with the waste service. And you may also want to do things like monitor the customer awareness campaigns. If people are continually putting recycle, uh, non-recyclable waste into the recycling bins, did they even know that that's what was happening? And if they didn't, maybe you want to take some control action like um, putting a, a notice on their bin or putting a leaflet through their door or actually getting somebody to chap in the door and tell them what's going wrong. Everyone happy with that before we move on? OK, so I think you can see from that kind of diagram, it's not hugely technical. It doesn't go into great detail. So it's suitable both for the business who can see it and understand it and go, yep, that's pretty much what we do. Or they can look at it and go, oh, actually, you've forgotten something. We need to get money because some of the equipment we need is the extra bins and you haven't got anything in there where we um, involve the finance people to get the budget sorted. So it gives a, an overview. And business can then tick a box and go signed off 25th of February 2022. This is how my business works. Thank you very much. And everyone can agree before they move on. That's a fairly simple one and you'll find um, You'll find templates on Lucidchart to produce those. 
some of them can get really complicated. And um, that, I would suggest, may actually veer into too complicated. Yes, you can understand it. But that one, I suggest, is understood better by the organisation than the people that are trying to understand the organisation. But there's no, there's no, um, here's what you can and can't do. If that works for your analysis, then go for it. Here's another one that's slightly different. You remember the case study in your lab for the garage. Well, here's a, a diagram for that garage to take on insurance work. And we can see uh, different people being involved, the garage, the owner, the insurance company, the appraiser, and the sorts of things that they have to do. The car owner has an accident. Are the repairs covered? The insurance company says, OK, we need to figure it out, and they send out an appraiser who goes to the customer and says, yeah, OK, they're covered, and this is how much it costs. Go get it fixed. So they go to the body shop to ask for the car to be repaired. That repair's sent back to the owner. So there may be a few back and forth here. Until eventually the estimate is fine. You pay for the repairs. Hopefully they're good repairs and the body shop gets repeat business. But the car owner can then go back and say, yep, we want the cash, please. And if they get the cash, the customer's happy. So it's a different type of business analysis. It's a different type of diagram. There's no, um, there's no plan, do that kind of stuff. This is more of a um, how the business works type thing. So that everybody's clear in their head how it all fits together. So there's a few things that you have to bear in mind when we're doing this. Um, because part of the reason we do it is to get some agreement about what the business processes are and how they work, then clearly there's, there'll be an iterative process involved here because you won't get everything right first time. So you'll have to go back and redraw. You might have things that you've missed either as part of that process or there might be actual processes that somebody goes, yeah, but what about? Um, we've only shown them from one point of view and as I've said already, it's important to take them from both points of view. It might look very different to um, each of these different types of people, how this process works. The insurance company might take a week to get an appraiser to get to the car owner. And that's a perfectly valid business process. But it misses out this customer be happy bit because if I had to wait a week to figure out whether I could get my car fixed, I think I'd be unhappy and I would also not be able to go anywhere. So you need to think about how these things work from both sides. It's helpful to number things and that makes it easy to talk about them. If we just say, oh, we're in the enable phase and we're doing enabling, well, great. But we are enabling the customer awareness campaign or the established skill sets or recruiting staff or acquiring storage and equipment. So putting numbers onto these things can be really helpful just to say, yeah, so this is M1. OK, so we're talking about customer satisfaction. Just as a, an adjunct to that, if you're getting to the point that you need more than nine of these, then your diagram's probably getting too big. And you might want to think about splitting it up. And I said earlier, we Part of the reason for doing this is to try and understand the difference between what the organisation does and what it would like to do and what you would like it to do and what the uh, perfect way of doing it is. 
So it's about um, understanding and throwing a light onto that gap analysis. So sometimes what these things are, are what's expected, not how they currently do it. It's 2022, pretty much everyone expects you to be able to book a hotel room on a web page. But this hotel doesn't do it. So you might want to put stuff in there saying, OK, well, actually, here's how we should be doing this. And as I say, that's part of that gap analysis. The difference between how the business currently approaches things and best practice, uh, more efficient ways, you know, however you want to express it. And that brings us back actually very much to the very first lecture where I talked about BSAs gaining experience as they go along. Experience in business analysis, experience in software systems, experience in ways of approaching problems. Because the more of that experience that you have, the more that you can bring into your analysis and help the business see that there may be other ways of doing things. A better approach, a more efficient approach, a cheaper approach. So the analysis isn't just what they do, it's what they might do. And actually, you may have two diagrams. Here's what you're doing. Here's actually what you could be doing. Any questions about that? OK. In that case, um, I'm expecting you to be at the point now that you have pretty much finished that self-guided uh, lab. So you've done all the stuff that I've asked you to do and you've created all the diagrams for that smaller case study uh, that I'd identified and asked you to create. So what you should be doing now really in the lab is in your groups, starting to create the diagrams that you're going to need for your final report. So even though on the next slide I've put tutorial, it's tutorial slash lab slash whenever you guys want to meet, because what you should be thinking of doing is thinking about the case study, thinking about all the information that you have gleaned, both by studying the business, by talking to people from your own experience and bringing them all together to start to create these business activity models. Now, part of the reason I put up that poll is um, to, to um, suggest some things. I mean, there's some up on the slide, what, four, five? Up on the slide. But there's been 48 responses to that poll. So between the class, you have found nearly 50 business processes that you might want to model. So you're starting to see um, that there might be quite a lot to this. And indeed, some of these reports can get quite big because you're going to have lots of diagrams displaying lots of processes. So I want you, as part of your lab, as part of your tutorial, to think about the case study and start to create these business activity models. Thinking about the processes, modeling the processes, thinking about thinking about all these different bits to enable plan, monitor, control for all these different processes and committing them to paper, even if only virtually, as part of your report and for sign off by the business. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Okay, I'm seeing some thumbs up. 
All right, um, if no one's got any questions, let me stop the recording.